Hi, thanks very much. Um, just in case it's not on the presentation, our stock code is ESI, just to confuse everyone between Environmental Clean Technologies Limited and ESI. Um, let's move forward, if it works. It's a normal disclaimer. What I'll try and present tonight is a, a, a brief snapshot of who we are and what we do, an introduction to our two technologies, coal dry, which is the more commercially developed technology, and the second technology coming on stream in the next 12 to 24 months called Mapmore. Also, a bit of a, uh, an insight into the project we plan to pull together in Victoria's Latrobe Valley at the Loyang Power Station, and also a bit of a financial breakdown on the costs of how we do what we do, or the indicative costs of them. From my point of view, a technology that's in trying to commercially develop has to say its numbers if it's to be taken seriously. And I would point your intention, particularly of investors, to that key fact in this particular industry segment. So I'll move on. First of all, in, on taking over the company as chief executive in, in 2007, 2008, um, I put sales and marketing at the centre of the business. We invested very heavily into doing lots and lots of um, research into the key markets that we seek to, to participate in. That's China first, India second, Indonesia third, United States, and of course some local uh, development here in Australia, because it's always wise to move your IP forward in your home market where you have experience. Uh, and then within that, we look to the strategic markets we've got our knowledge on, look at where our technology fits within it, and then form strategic par partnerships with various routes to market that can help us access um, those key markets we, we're in. We've done, I believe, very well within China. I'll come to that within a moment. So the two technologies, the first is coal dry. And this is a method for dewatering lignite or subbituminous coal. Now, just for, to have people who aren't experienced in what that is, this is the dirtiest, wettest coal, and because it's wet, it produces more CO2, and also it has another problem, it's spontaneous combustion. So if you dig brown coals out of the ground, or particularly lignite out of the ground, there is a high propensity for it to catch fire. So the power stations in the Latrobe Valley, for example, will mine with an 18-hour buffer supply of coal on a just-in-time basis, or near just-in-time basis. There is no market for the trading of brown coal because to export it, you have to put it in all sorts of blankets in the ships, etc. It's very wet and it has very low energy value. Um, and also, it's the dirt, it produces the dirtiest power stations in the world. And the, where, the, where it is mined, it is typically only mined for local consumption. Because it's cheap, it also has traditionally produced some of the cheapest electricity in the world. There is more brown coal in the world than black coal. Our second technology takes the pelleting technology, which I'll, I'll explain with coal dry, and creates a, a, a pellet using nickel tailings, iron ore, or mill scale. Um, I would emphasize for the other presenters in the room, nickel tailings particularly, to make a high grade um, iron or, an iron, pig iron or a tool steel uh, from what's in those nickel tailings, and also helps to reduce the, uh, the cost of um, nickel tailings and the new cost we're seeing in the Western economies. So the coal dry process, and I'll make this really simple because I'm not an engineer. Um, the, the first part is if you may remember that your parents may have had a, a Kenwood mixer as a kid growing up and instead of just baking cakes, with it, they'd, take, they'd take the front off it every now and again and put the meat mixer on the front. So this has an auger in it. So the secret of the coal dry process is first to drop the coal into something very, very similar to the, the meat mixer. It works the coal and that sets off the chemical reaction that makes the coal spontaneously combust or it starts to lead to it. And as that's happening, we add water to it, and the shearing effect of the auger inside what we call a pug mill and extruder um, starts to set off this chemical reaction, and the bonds in the coal collapse, and the water start, it starts to heat up, noticeably sweat, and you can, it starts to be warm, as high as 30 degrees centigrade, and we suppress its tendency to catch fire by counterintuitively adding water to it. At the next step, we extrude the coal into sausages. It's not the most attractive product in the world when it comes out, because it's steaming, it's wet, and it's brown. Yeah? Um, and it hits a conditioning belt. Now, I would point out that extruders and uh, extruders and um, attritioners are about 150-year-old technology well established in the brick-making industry. And we're dealing with one of the world's leading vendors of this called JC Steel from America, and they've been in business about 140 years. The product is extruded onto a conditioning belt, a porous coal belt, and we blow warm, dry air across the product, um, which lifts the surface moisture off in a controlled fashion for anywhere between five minutes and 30 minutes, depending on the coal. We access this warm, dry air 
through heat exchange from cooler return water from a co-located power station or from the cooling from the um, from the tower itself which is a higher grade of heat which makes us even more economic this is waste heat which is too low in temperature to be sold for other purposes in australia so it what it also does is by taking this waste heat from the cooling tower, we decrease the amount of evaporative loss, the water that you see coming steaming out of the top of a cooling tower, by as many tonnes of water as we take off the coal itself. So we're reducing the need for the power station we co-locate with to go back to local river systems to suck water in, and in effect it can also drought-proof or temp partially drought-proof that co-located power station. After the product has been conditioned, where the skin has developed on it, it drops into what we call a pack bed dryer or a hopper. From the top down, it travels down where we put more warm dry air across it. And we take that warm dry air, becomes warm wet air, and at that point we can choose to put it through a chiller system to recover the water next to it as well. Once there's an economic use for that water, and I would say that we get water off the coal at a cheaper price than the desal system in Victoria can get water for, um, it has an industrial use. Even in the co-located power station, even in such a situation where there is a drought and the local river systems can't support uh, the, the draw of the power station. No water equals no electricity. What also is really important there is that water can, is used within the manufacturing process of the coal dry. At the end of, in Victoria's case, at the end of about 48 hours, about an hour for every percent of moisture in the coal, it drops onto the, it gets put out, it can be stored, handled, transported, just like black coal, hence the term black coal equivalent that we've coined. For more clarity, in Victoria, the coal is about 60 to 62% moisture content, and we can bring it down to 12% moisture content. So the starting raw coal is about 2,000 kilocalories of energy, and what comes out of our process is about 5,900 kilocalories per tonne, and just if you can hold this number in your heads, the Newcastle FOB rate for black coal with higher sulphur content and higher ash content, which is a, a cost on production and electricity generation, is about 120 US dollars per tonne, thereabouts. Just hold that number. You can see my pro the product on the bottom there as well. So the next technology, and I'll come back to coal dry in a moment, for the for, is, is pretty unique. It takes the, the coal dry technology, pelletizes up um, nickel tailings, iron ore, as low as 45% FE content iron ore, so some of that's considered overburden in some markets, and, and mill scale, which is a waste product from the steelmaking industry, we pelletise that at a lower cost per tonne than the, the full coal drying solution, and we run that through a retort which we have patents on, or we have participation agreements for those patents, and it runs effectively down a tube, we apply greater and greater heat to it from the top to the bottom, the the volatiles in the brown coal, which is unique to brown coal, set off, sets off a chain reaction in heat. By the time that pellet has hit the bottom of the retort, it's glowing like a heat bead in a barbecue. And we blast it with air, it melts into an induction furnace, and it's our working assumption that we can do this at or lower than the traditional cost of a, of a typical um, iron making plant. More importantly, We've, we've tested samples of nickel tailings and mill scale from China, Mongolia, the United States, India, Australia in numerous locations, particularly for nickel tailings, and we recover 100% of the metals that are in those tailings. So in some, particularly nickel tailings, again, there is high cobalt content, which can be extracted from tailings, which is sitting on the ground. If you're in Queensland, those tailings are going to start to attract tailings taxes so we can mitigate cost at the same time as create a, a highly profitable offtake. So that's Matmore. That will be coming, our next step on that is to move through the scaling up process at our, our site, and that's as much as I'd like to say about Matmore at this point. This is really the jewel in our crown, but we're pursuing coal drive first, which is a highly lucrative um, opportunity for us, but because we also need to be able to make pellets at scale, which is important. The marketing slide about having resource technology markets and then a project. We should add in their capital as well. Basically, Australian co these, the first graph is a graph on coal prices. There's relative certainty of rising coal prices and more importantly, rising demand for coal. 
The average power station is depreciated over a 20-year life cycle. Um, you know, a lot of the market intelligence is saying that China is producing a new coal-fired power station once a month. There is a shortage of coal. China has become a net importer of coal in the last two years. They have massive reserves of brown coal, in Inner Mongolia particularly, that work for our process. Um, before I proceed with this slide, I would point out that uh, I used to work for Siemens at, at, in Europe. And when I said I was going to take this job, the head of power generation told me I was nuts because you can't dry brown coal. It's impossible. But if you can, let me know. Because if it burns like black coal, it will price like black coal because right? you burn kilocalories. So I've done the good corporate thing of pulling together partners bigger than the small company that I now operate. So if we start at the bottom going upwards, the coal dry technology is owned by, by ECT. We partnered with Arup. Arup are possibly the most risk-averse engineering, global engineering firm in the world. They have put their own money into helping us pursue this technology in exchange for a very, very small royalty on Australian production. And they've produced a feasibility study to the, uh, three years ago to the tune of plus minus 15% and a plus 30. And now what we're moving to do with them, as announced the ASX a couple of weeks ago, is to move forward after raising additional capital with the first stage of a design for tender. That design for tender will be participated in with Wally Parsons and GHT, who are operating partners with Loyang Power Station, with whom we have an MOU uh, to access the coal and heat and site and energy and all those things. Um, that will eventually produce a, a design for tender which will be priced on a guaranteed maximum price basis from McConnell Dow, who's, who's a, a very large construction company with experience in building similar type of plants to us. In addition to that, Transfield Services, who you'll see in the next slide is one of the owners of Loyang Power Station, will do our commissioning and operate and maintain. Uh, then transportation, Patrick's are the, uh, are the people best suited to supply that and we're in negotiations with them to get the offtake for export to China. The reason, our company name is Environmental Clean Technologies. The reason why we're selling it, we seek to sell export grade product to China is because we've received zero funding from state or federal government for developing a working CO2 reduction strategy uh, solution in Victoria. I'll come to that in a moment because it's actually the most attractive, one of the most attractive things about this. But in this particular model, we're a black coal equivalent exporter, generating new revenue stream for the co-located power station, new job stimulus to put in new rail and port infrastructure in the state of Victoria, and also just to Put the last thing in, from offtake into context. We have an MOU now with Da Tung, possibly the third biggest energy generator in the world. They purchase 200 million tonnes of black coal a year and have 105 gigawatts of capacity worldwide. That's about 40 times Victoria's capacity. And they're going to do a 2,000 tonne test burn at the end of Q3-ish um, of our product in the Tingtao power station with the view to giving us an order for 2 million tonnes of product per year. So I'd like you to remember the $120 a tonne FOB price for kind of similar coal out of Newcastle and also 2 million tonne potential order with Da Tung subject to a test burn. This is this the makeup of the Loyang investors because people tend to ask me that question when I do this, power, this presentation. AGL owns 32.5%. TEPCO, which is the company with the nuclear power station problem in Japan. 32.5, uh, Transfield Services at 14, and then smaller investors make up the rest. So, unlike many of my competitors, I'm desperately keen to make sure that we get investment and sell product. The total cost, X Works, and I can't tell you the coal price, but this is a rough estimate, is $12.93-ish to make a tonne of product plus the cost of coal. That's Australian cost based on worst case capital and OPEX estimates. So for less than $31 a tonne, it doesn't include debt, I would point out, for less than $31 a tonne, we have a product which FOB comes out of Newcastle, similar grades, for $120 a tonne. Add $40 for freight, which is way over the top for freight to China on bulk exports. Right, that's for, for less than $70, $71 a tonne, we can compete, it's, we're delivering it to China for what you can buy for FOB for $120. Now, the Chinese have an index called the Qinquan Dao, um, and to give an absolute worst case estimate, that's, a, that's an, 
an FOB out of China index, so it's effectively what they call CIF, what it, you know, what it costs landed in China at 117.85 with a 10% discount, which is as bad a terms for selling coal as you could probably get, we still look like having a margin of around $46 a tonne on a cost of production at these levels. Okay. Now, because I'm a big fan of carbon tax, we've, I've sat there holding fire, but we put out a paper in November last year called um, CO2 reduction in Victoria, delivery or dogma? Because there's a lot of talk about CO2 reduction. And unfortunately, it's gotten confused with dogma. And a lot of agencies have put out these papers about how to reduce CO2. And whatever happens, either political party won't say the word coal. Victoria over-contributes um, over -contributes CO2 in ratio to the size of the economy of Victoria and Australia. That's because brown coal produces substantial amounts of CO2 because you've got to burn the water to get to the carbon in the coal. The various propositions is to replace the brown coal generators in Victoria with a combination of wind and gas. So we've updated our numbers. We will put out a more detailed statement to the ASX about this in due course. But the cost at a $29 per tonne carbon tax, which is where it's going to be going to, if you build a black coal power station, just a normal, uh, 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 this generation, black coal known technology power station in the state of Victoria to replace for the sake of it Hazelwood, you would replace like for like emissions, you would reduce them by as much as 50%, 45 to 55%. That's the whole target for the next 20, 30 years in one go. To make it even more interesting, if you burn 20% coal dry in the existing fuel mix of any one of the three brown coal generators in Victoria, and they have slightly different mathematical outcomes, but pretty similar, no capital modifications except for the coal handling facilities to get it into the production, 20% burn in their shanty would decrease CO2 emissions by 8%. That's the entire target. Now, I would also point out that the Victorian economy depends upon cheap energy. That's why the resources are imported or exported from other states into Victoria. If CO2 pricing results in like-for-like -like production of energy across Australia, wind and gas being the dominant flavours, electricity prices will reach parity between the states. That will lead to the contraction of Victoria's manufacturing economy as people cease to export their resources from Queensland and other states down to Victoria to be manufactured because they'll save on the transportation costs causing severe economic harm to the state of Victoria. The solution to that problem is sitting there at the fingertips of the government if they're prepared to say the word coal. So I hope that agitates the audience as much as it agitates me because I live with that on a daily basis. So just in summary, the company is attractive to global markets, particularly China and India. So there's a strong Asian exposure for the technology. It's disruptive. I would point out to those who have strong positions in black coal that should this technology roll out um, really, really effectively across Asia, particularly China, it has the potential to cap growth in black coal prices, but not for many decades. Um, it has game-changing potential in that drying brown coal is the gateway technology to allow coal to oil, coal to urea, things that benefit from the high volatility of brown coal, which would allow other industrial process projects to take place around the world and to improve their economics exponentially. It can also help to subsidise the business cases of local generators who can reduce their CO2 emissions, maybe even forward sell CO2 emissions to build next generation black coal fired power stations at substantially less cost than burying CO2 in the ground. It it opens up new revenue opportunities for Australia in global markets. And from the point of view of the Matmore technology, there's big potential there as well. So at that point, I'm a big fan of questions. I hope there's plenty of them. Please feel free. Great. Put your hands together for Cos Galvez, please.